Hello, and welcome to this continuing live code series on creating a JavaScript web application. We've been working on the Jerry Live open source well-being instrument. For the last few <clears throat> episodes, we've been building out this um, user role management feature where users can be assigned to groups, and those groups also contain homes, and that means that a user should only see the homes that are assigned to the same groups the, to which the user is assigned. So, really quick. Weird. One moment. You should have asked me that before. I'm out of sync. Now I'm, I guess I'm in sync with the Git repository. So let's see. I have the pull request here. Recent changes. <clears throat> All right, so let me check my Git graph. Where's the Git graph? Huh. Git lens, Git history, Git blame. This thing I can't figure out how to work. Get project management. There it is, good graph. Oh, now it's visible. Not sure if I just wasn't noticing it a minute ago. Okay, so it seems I have the one viewer. I'm gonna enable this uh Twitch highlighter extension, I figured out how to get it to work. <coughs> Excuse me. So anyone viewing, and I'll mention this a few times throughout the cast, but uh, anyone viewing on Twitch right now, while this is live streaming, can actually highlight lines of code. The command is in the lower left-hand corner of the screen. It's like type bang, highlight, a line number, and a comment. The comment is optional. <coughs> We need to highlight a line number. Uh, so the things in angle brackets are, you replace those with the actual thing. So I'll just give a quick example. Highlight 11. That highlights that line of code. The line of code brings my attention to it. And I didn't leave a comment, but it tells me who highlighted it. And I'll show you one with a comment. This is cool. Then both the highlights will hang around there until I clean them up. So, yeah, if you're noticing any bugs or any typos or just have any comments or questions about the code, how it works, feel free to use this tool during the live stream. And I'll mention that as more viewers coming in and out of the room. All right, so let's take a look at this issue. There's a couple remaining tasks. I cleaned it up a little bit um, <clears throat> just for simplicity so I don't have to spend too much more time on this. It's already been quite a long effort. So the home report page should show not authorized when a user visits without proper group membership. I've already done this on the home page. So I can probably borrow the code there. And there we go, we're up and running. Oh, 
wish I could just copy this URL from the terminal. Very cool link. PyCharm has that feature, copy URL. All right, so when we go to homes, I'm logged in as a user who only can see a few home, who can only see a few homes. And each home has a report page. And what I need to verify is that this user can only see the report pages for these three homes. So in another browser, I'm gonna go ahead and get a home ID that this user's not, to which this user's not assigned. Let's see. So there's, they're in Ornella. Now we're gonna look at Tom Mella. And I'll grab a home report page. Well, I'll just demo this real quick. So the homepage <clears throat> for Tom Mella is this. And they're not authorized to see that, but when I type report, I think it is. It shows me the report. <clears throat> so I just have to carry over the access control. It would be nice if I could do this in a router, but I think I had some problems with that last time. It's a really good way in the client at least to provide access controls route guards and of course your server needs to enforce those access control rules as well so let me see how i did this <coughs> access control home auth container so yeah i think for some reason I recall, I barely recall this, but uh, I couldn't get things to work here with a route guard. So I had to, something about these route guards are synchronous and in order to check authentication, I need to do that asynchronously. I need to call the server and get a response back from the server. Because it involves subscribing to not only the home <coughs> or making a query to get the home group and then see if the user's in that group. So it was just non-trivial. So I'm wondering, oh, I'm gonna have some code duplication here. Basically, let me check out that home auth container. So I can close this, I was doing something there. I'm wondering if I could render this in the home auth container as well. I think have the, the router render the content in or something somehow. I'm seriously considering and uh, trying to work towards uh, porting this over from Blaze to Vue. I think Vue router and just in general Vue has a really good reactivity model can do these asynchronous things and route guards and whatnot. Okay. So we're not, we don't need homes, we need, I mean, sorry, we don't need activities, we need homes. Home activities, report. So here's the auth container. <clears throat> it really just has some imperative Logic to show a spinner, probably while it's authorizing, while we're waiting the asynchronous event, and then it'll render the template or not authorized. So I'm wondering if uh, I can figure out a way to declare a block here and I can render in a dynamic template into that block. Because otherwise, this auth container code. It's only 24 lines, it's not too bad. But I just would like to avoid um, these two templates getting out of sync, the home and home uh, report. If we change the author rules, I don't want the pages to behave differently. And this is that asynchronous call current user how many yeah and also I'd like to figure out a way of doing this uh, 
little less imperatively. But I think even in view, I would be looking at toggling uh, a data property. You know, same thing with the reactive variables. And just view has the data, and if you view JS component has is reactive by default, so we didn't have to drag along these reactive variables, which are just a little bit annoying. I think one of the limitations of the meteor, or the blaze design. Okay, so how can I share this code? Well, let's go to the blaze docs and just take a quick look. Hey, what's up, H3H394? <laughs> Just saw your message. Doesn't have timestamps, so if, I, if I'm a little bit delayed in responding, I apologize in advance. <clears throat> uh, if you just joined the channel, um, I'm not sure if you can see the previous chat, but in the lower left-hand corner of the screen, uh, the stream view is a command you can type in the chat. Uh, you know, bang, highlight, space, align number and space an optional comment you know, without those angle braces. That'll um, direct my attention to a line of code on the screen. It'll actually highlight the line of code on the screen. So feel free to test that out if you want to see how it works. And if you notice anything while I'm coding and you want to point it out, if you have a comment or a question or you, know, you see a typo or uh, want to know how something works, I can, uh, I'll see that and I can respond. All right, so it looks like So they're actually putting a whole com uh, component inside of this template. Uh, that makes sense, but I'm thinking it's in, inside out from what I'm trying to achieve. I'm not trying to render, well, I am trying to render a subcomponent, this home component, but I, I need to control or compose this user is authorized method into the parent template. I want to, essentially, I want to share that and use it as a condition. And Vue.js, uh, I'm probably in React, but just my background right now at work, my day job, I'm working with Vue. Um, you know, you can just design, you can just define kind of, you can compose Vue of other um, components. So you just define these either you know, like data properties or methods or watchers or anything. And then you can say, um, you can sub, you can add those components. To, so I'm wondering if there's a way I can do that in, bl in Blaze. I'm not sure. What, I can't remember what the word for that is. Yeah, but essentially, When you define your component, there's a property. <laughs> and I can't remember that off the top of my head for whatever. I've only been using Vue for about a month. Yeah, you just kind of, well, you can either extend it, another component. 
there's another way you can define it as uh, including, the kind of sort of including it. But it's very similar to Blaze in a lot of ways, like the lifecycle hooks. Here it is. Yeah, it's just components. Yeah, and, and things are pretty rationally designed, I think. It's really easy to follow. Um, just not clear on how to port from Blaze to view it. I'd like to do it incrementally without having to do the whole project at once. Um, working out from the maybe the child nodes into the parent nodes and eventually replacing the router. I think if I did it all at once, it would be really a big challenge. Okay, so reusable components. One thing, so this is the part that needs to change. And I think this Blaze has the concept of dynamic components. I know Vue does. <laughs> I'm kind of longing for Vue a little bit in this case. But um, if there's just a generic like render template and you pass in a template name, This might be similar to what I'm looking for here. Is but I don't want the JavaScript API. Simple dynamic. This is it. Okay, cool. I knew there were in the back of my mind there was something like this. Choose a template to include dynamically by name. Here we go. And I think where I'll get this template name from is the route. I'll actually just pass that down. So that I don't have to put more conditional logic in here. So what I'll do, let me take a look here. Home's routes. Close the sidebar. Um, here it is. So this one I can pass in a data object. What view? Let's see what's the name of this dang uh, router. Iron router. That's another thing that meteor community is they didn't, well, they sort of embraced an official router, but it, it wasn't part of core. It just became part of, in the Meteor Guide, it was recommended. 
and, and I'm not sure how well maintained any of the routers are, either of the two main router options. This one has been dormant since 2017, though. I don't know if it's been forked. Well, let's go there to the documents because that's what I'm using. And what we want is passing some data. Rendering templates with data. Uh, okay. I want a named data. So the data object will contain whatever this function outputs, but I'd like a named attribute. So let me just try this. I suppose I would just call it template is uh, uh, home. Now let's see. How. That's a string. Let's just take a look at the uh, property. Make sure you got passed in there. This, oh, attributions there. Expected token, expected. So this is an ob object. Second argument is an object. Okay, cool. And then, of course, that, that makes sense. Good guess, this is going to be a, a trickier one when we go to migrate. I'm doing some very specific... Uh, simple we'll just take a route and property render a yeah it does look like view uh view cat and in fact i'm really wanting to port over to view i think i mentioned that probably a few times in this stream and in previous streams but i don't know a clear path to go from blaze to view have you worked with uh, meteor or blaze view cat So now if I go back to the home page, uh, you still see it's not authorized. So let me double check if I saved. Uh, no, I have never used Ember ViewCat. I was, um, though I'm inspired by the kind of community oriented <laughs> ethos of that project. I think they do a really good job. And it's always been the underdog. I was watching a documentary on it recently you know, it's been the underdog to Amber, um, uh, not, sorry. Um, well, I'm drawing a blank now. Well, obviously React, but uh, Angular. And I think they brought a lot of really important things to JavaScript development. But what, what's your experience with Ember View Cat? This is not giving me a named variable. It's just a bunch of posts, and I want a named var variable in here. 
Uh, what, well, basically what's your experience? I, I don't have any experience with Ember, but I have read about it a few times in the past. I watched a documentary on it. I think they're, it's a really interesting project and they've got a great community ethos. Uh, and I'd like to see more, uh, well, it's good to see diversity in the front end space to recognize that we're not all, um, that React isn't the only way to do things. Uh, but at the same time, um, I'd like to see less fragmentation in the front end space, so <laughs> those are kind of a conflict. Like everything shouldn't be view specific or React specific or Ember specific, if possible. I think web components sort of give us a way an undergirding that we can have common, uh, uh, common um, interface to compile React component or view component and share between projects. Okay, so your company's using Ember. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, let's see. There's a, I think there was recently a, an Ember conference that might have a bunch of uh, videos up. I've been watching, you know, I've been kind of orienting myself towards view because I have that opportunity right now to transition a project. Um, this Jerry Life, for example, but uh, let me see, community, contribute meetups, job board, EmberConf. There's a really cool uh, Ember documentary. Right here. I'll send it in the chat. I recommend it. I don't wanna. Oh, that's not it. Somehow my JavaScript was still in my clipboard. Copy. Cool though. I watch this. It's inspiring. There you go. Yep. Let's see. Embercon next year, March. Do they have the? Uh... Huh, I thought they would have the videos online. You might be able to find it. That's a really great way. You know, I learned by watching these speakers and what they're doing. their menu well let me get to it <laughs> it's weird all right cool all right so how do I just tell This home's route. You know, I can tell it to render the template, but I've already got the auth container set up. That was a struggle just to get this working to, uh, again, I would like to just do this with a route guard and then I can share that route guard between these two um, cases and it would be job done, but it didn't work. Yeah, your company probably, yeah, I don't know if they're, I've not seen Ember and Meteor much about using them together. I think though that might just be that Ember's always been sort of an underdog, so the Meteor community also flocked to React, and I think that was to the, det to the broader detriment. But I don't know, people really like 
React. The other way I can think of is that this name property is available in the template context. And in here I can define a helper that returns a template name. You know, maybe not too bad, uh, but the stuff I would just like to be able to do in the router, and this is just kind of too points recently that this router has proved to be deficient, or at least my understanding of it. Like, why can't I return a name, an object with name properties? Do I, well, wait, so what is this? So dead, dead, uh, home auth container. This has been another interesting inconsistency is the, um, that, you know, in JavaScript, this is all the word this, the keyword this is pretty shifty. So to get a consistent way of uh, referring to the template instance, you have to either capture this or capture the template instance, depending on the context. So it's very kind of, well, just a little bit redundant to have to write that all over the place, but console log. No, no, it is one second, right? Just gonna take a quick look uh, to see if that data is getting assigned. Oh. Oh, yes. You have to call it then. There we go. Yeah. So what do we got here? The data is null. Okay, well that's one thing. But that doesn't seem to be working. Home, oh, yeah, of course. Been going about this wrong the whole time. All right, let me grab this. I'm looking at the home report route over here, but this is the home route. Okay, so, you know, easy mistakes to make. Stuff like that. Now let's take a look. Now we got our data. It has a property. Okay, so this is how I was expecting it to work. So no problem, no worries. Now I can actually just use a data property directly. Now that should show the template. Okay, everything's good to go. And I don't need to you know, any helpers down here, which kind of bury the logic. You know, I believe that it would be a lot easier to understand when the router can do certain things like this. Um, I'll name it authorized template. So that when the user is authorized, <laughs> this is separating sort of a strange actuated action at a distance, but uh, when the user is authorized, show the render the authorized template that comes in from the route. Yeah. Maybe it's not too bad. Okay. So let's see. Now the template, I need this template dynamic right here. So this thing right here. And I don't need to pass any data because it's handling its own. Okay, so if everything goes well here, I will be able to see one of these homes. Yeah, all right, cool. 
home auth container. So I think I can share this home auth container now. So that works, and now on my other browser, I'm just going to grab one that the user should not have access to. So this home they don't have, whoops, well, and there's a comma there, that's strange, I should give me a not found, but okay, so they're not authorized for that, and they're not authorized for that, whereas, if I just swap this back in they can see the report all right all right that wasn't so bad view card do you have any projects you're working on in your spare time anything uh, or h3h have you have you done any work on open source I'm not sure who else in the chat room so let me double check here didn't tell me. I'm not sure how to see who's in the chat. The user's in chat. Function doesn't really list the right names there. If there's a better Twitch chat plugin or something I can use. An OBS to keep an eye on the Twitch. In any case. Alright, so let's hop back over here. So our auth seems to be working now. The authorization part of that. What did I change? So oh, okay, wait a minute. I better double check this. <clears throat> I think that it was because I had a typo in there. Yeah. So that's good. I'm going to fix that typo. Or it's not the typo so much as the error. When a route is, re when a, let's see. Home is not found, or the group. Yeah, home. Yeah, it's what it's looking for. It's a home with that ID. Uh, it's thrown in there. Let me double check on the server side for this current user can access home method. Current user. Where's my symbols? All right. So here it is.
residence page is the next one. So right now we have this page that lists all the residents. So there's 19 pages of residents, 10 residents per page. And looking at the homes, I should only see residents from North Rachel Land, Freddie Town, and Colfin Brewery. Those are some weird names, but I'm definitely seeing other um, homes here, and hence residents. All right, so I've done a little bit of work similar to this. Let's again try to reuse that code. If I think for a moment, I have a method called get user visible resident IDs, I think. So let's check the server methods. Maybe that's a good start. Huh. Oh, there we go. Oh, dang. Not that one, this one. Let's get all resident IDs, get all resident, get all count minutes, resident activities, user visible active residents. Ah. I think this is controlled through a subscription. So I've got this server method. Let's go take a look at the um, client code. This is the residence page uh, for all of them. Okay, essentially it's a reactive table. Or I don't know if it's reactive, it's just a table. Ah, this is different. Where am I at? Uh, actually, open up the home resident table. All right, so here are the residents. Here we go. Page header. So there's an admin section. A filter panel, it's a reactive table, okay. So that means it relies on a reactive publication. So let me check the HTML or the JavaScript here. The table settings. Check over a template subscriptions already twice. That's not necessary. And I have to kind of split these out because the uh, details are spread across a couple of collections: the home names in the homes collection, resident names in the resident collection, and all of these these rows are each a residency that, that groups the two together. So maybe I'll and I want it to be sort of reactive and, and we, we really needed to allow you to search through them. So Freddie, you know, dynamic filtering is very useful. So I want to preserve that. All right, there's, let's say there's three viewers in the chat. Just a quick uh, 
heads up if you weren't here before to any of the new um, viewers in the lower left hand corner of the stream there's a command you can type in the chat bang highlight space a line number space a comment that'll actually highlight a line of code on the screen here and add your comment uh, comment is optional um, but the line number is required and that comment will hang out I'll see it and I'll be able to to respond to it so feel free to use that if you have any question about how the code works or you notice any typos I appreciate um, help spotting bugs as I'm typing so just quickly I'll demo it 42 there's one example and did I spell it right Alright, there's another command. Oh, there's something on 42. Let's try 43. There it goes. Okay, so that makes sense. There's nothing to highlight on 42. <laughs> but there you go. And then you see the comment there. Pretty handy little thing. Line's a shortcut for highlight. I just put the highlight there so that if I can dismiss the highlight. All right, so this is going to be a little bit of a mind boggler. But what I think I'm doing is just assembling this all on the client side. So that's pretty inefficient. Well, I could be done on the server at least. Let's just. Uh, Let me double check though. It's a property, isn't it? Not a method. So if I move this to the server, yeah, 182. So basically, yeah, it's all of them. So I'm pushing a whole lot of data to the client first. which I'll probably have to do in any case because uh, we need these dynamic filters to not have to wait. But if I show mini Mongo here, that means I have 182 residencies subscribed, 324 residents. So a whole lot of data. And I do believe this um, page is a little slow to render on larger systems because of this, it's sort of sending everything basically and then parsing on the client. Hmm. And then, you know, some systems are gonna have a lot more homes going on, but primarily the residents, there's gonna be thousands of residency, residencies. And if you include the departed ones, uh, well, our dummy data doesn't really have, oh yeah, 560. So yeah, you know, people moving in and out of these busy systems. So I think I've uncovered like a bigger problem with the code as it's written. So I can try to improve it here. I don't want to wrestle with this for too long though. I do want to wrap up this feature. See if I can move this to server side subscriptions firstly, so that we don't have to push so much data to the client. But also the fact that I need to parse it makes it difficult. Because we can't just subscribe people to these residencies and expect this information to be available. Um, there's also this idea of a composite publication, meaning that if I publish this residency, it'll also bring along the resident and home so we can run the information. But I'm trying to, it's not a part of Meteor Core and I'm trying to not rely on stuff that's not Meteor Core uh, so I can 
possibly port to Vue.js in a little while. Or just whatever, port away from Blades, uh, possibly port away, actually port away, from, port away from Meteor, I'm considering that. just things are falling away in Meteor. I guess that's what I'm on about. Because I think this is even a different package that uses a capital R. maintained since 2016. The first result coming from Google is this meteor package has not been maintained since 2016. There's the one I'm using here. It's not the official website. You know, this is a Google search results, so I can't really blame. is kind of the stuff I'm getting on. And this is back in 2015. People are worried about it. It's just really a bummer how much, you know, and I'm, I'm guilty of it too. I'm thinking about moving away from Meteor, as I mentioned a minute ago. But I'd like to move towards something more stable. And so I'm really considering uh, Django. Here we go. Just give me to the official. Repo, is it gone? There it is. Uh, relatively recent development, as Meteor goes. Server side pagination and filtering. This is something I've not really ever gotten to. This needs to return a collection, it looks like. Or a cursor, or not a cursor, but a um, selector. All right? Yes, this is a Mongo selector. So that's a limitation here. Because I'm actually wanting to return the parse document specifically for this table, the structure here. I don't think I'll be able to use the server-side pagination and filtering here. Well, unless I do... Actually, this would be residencies. The Mongo selector would be toggled by looking at the move out date. Each of these rows could still then filter, but the home name, it needs to filter on home name. And 
full name, where's in full name? And that's coming out of my parts to data here, so. Man, this is just gonna break. I think I'm going to have to move the bulk of this optimization to a different task. But what I can do is move this parsing code to a method, a server side method that returns these residencies sort of like with the data, the proper data structure. Leave these alone as they are, they're cool. This is working when they change the whether or not to include departed, it's changing the subscription. So I'm just double checking here. If I can just reuse these subscriptions, that's super simple. So 19 pages, zero pages. So just changed a couple lines of code, I think, right? Uh, intended some lint. I do lint as a separate commit. nice that it switches out all those quotes for me. Okay, let's check these publications. Not the methods, but residencies. Current user visible active residencies. redundant 
current user visible active residencies. So there should only ever be one residency. This needs to toggle also. <laughs> so all residents. That's the problem. All residencies. Both of these. Control K. All residencies, all residents. Current user visible. Active. Residencies, active residents. If I can pass in an argument here. That's a function, so. Pass named arguments, or is it just positional? Probably just positional. What I can use is um, an argument here. The main difference between here is the all visible current. Let's see, so I need the current user visible residencies in both cases. But whether or not they're active, that's I think the differentiating factor. So if I just say current user visible residencies and I have an argument for whether or not it's active, so to include or not include departed, then I can use this. Method and pass in the argument. So what would the argument name be? What's a meaningful thing? It's gonna be a Boolean and it's gonna be passed right here. Well, it would be called departed. Let me double check here or something. So essentially, <laughs> if this is true, the move out will exist and it will be departed.
find the other usages of this and add this argument. Current user visible act residencies. This is only used in three places. I would like a named argument here because just passing false is like what? What does that mean? Or in this case, yeah, it would be false. <laughs> hmm. Let me double check if I can do a named argument. could learn more about that low level publication API perhaps for the paginated thing but I think this is I'm on the right track here well let's go ahead and make this explicit through a variable So since they're not departed, we want that. too confusing here so the part equals false or right, where else is this used chat come on highlight highlight things like this for me <laughs> not a big deal to my responsibility okay and this now becomes current user visible oh come on what's going on here can't see if it's highlighting It's not simply a Boolean toggle, is it? Man.
because there's cases where I want to get all the all the residents inspect. This is the case. I want to get all the residents departed or not. <laughs> so I should just not have this check here. Hmm. Well, damn. There goes my idea about sharing code. I could do if I don't pass it, it's undefined, it's which is falsy. But if I check for these explicitly, It's not passed in. If the argument's not passed in, it'll be undefined. And then I want my selector to just be an empty object. Else I can use the value of it. Oh, no, no, no. Departed equals. Pass. Pass a keyword in JavaScript. That's a good idea, I guess. <laughs> oh, geez. Ah, uh, I have to spread it. I have to spread something here. Nothing. If it's undefined, I don't need to define this, but then I'm trying to spread it and it'll be undefined. Check this is going to work. So, well, I don't care if it's not 
Yeah, so triple equals uh, that works. All right. Well, this is control D. All right, so if this is not passed in, it's undefined. We'll do nothing. We'll find all the residencies. So then I don't need the active part in a minute. If it is passed in, use the value. In which case, I don't think I'll need the case of only showing departed, but you never know. It's there. So I'm just not going to... Where am I here? I'll close that. It's not relevant. Where's this subscription? So... Get current user visible residence. Sees. User visible residencies, but without the departed argument. See if this part works, and I'll look at the residents in a moment. Clean that up, but I think this toggle should work. If I double check my usage here, is now down to one, and that's the actual publication. So there we go. Seven pages, no need. Let's see if this changes. So, including departed. Uh oh. One thing is, I'm not sure if I have many departed residents in the dummy data, the mock data. chat if you have any questions or comments you can ask me anything about um, the project or the software development in general also if you see um, anything in the code you'd like to highlight you can use the highlight command from the lower left hand corner of your screen just exclamation highlight space a line number and if you want you can add an optional comment so basically replace both of the things in line or in, in angle braces and it'll actually highlight it on the screen here with your comment. So I can just show you real quick. There's a shortcut for it, line. Let's see, 30. This is else. And it highlights there in green. I can see it right there. And your comment shows up. So that's a way to um, participate in the development process if you're interested. Or if you notice anything like a missing... Well, missing semicolon or bugs or typos or using Python syntax in JavaScript, all those type of comments are welcome. All right, I believe this is, this is going to toggle the subscription now. Let me just, I mean, because that part hasn't changed. Where are we at? There we go. Got a comment there. Yeah, it is pretty cool. Pretty neat plugin. Thanks, Rekabik. Rec The other thing is, uh, I should have a ton of residents here in my mini Mongo. 324. Now we're really fortunate with this project. It's actually in production use in a system, a 
care system that spans an entire city. And right now, we're the reason we're rewriting this feature is that we realize that in the next couple of months, they're going to be adding a lot more residents and users. We started this project for a specific care community in the city. And uh, there's only about 500 residents in that care community. So we haven't had big problems with uh, the scale and amount of information visible to the end users who are helping to coordinate care for those residents. Now that we're, essentially we have um, a growing user base and a growing uh, number of residents, we have to address this issue. So we'll soon be looking at, you know, maybe a thousand residents or even in the current care home where there's 500 active residents, like residents who are actively living in the home, we have residents who have departed the home for various reasons. So those are adding up in any case. Uh, it will exceed, you know, a thousand people pretty quickly. So I can't just naively any longer <laughs> subscribe to all residents. Where is the page? This won't work anymore. Even the all homes is getting a little bit like well, questionable. So I think I have a template or a uh, subscription here. Yeah, it's um, well-being activities. So it's designed for caregivers in elder care homes. And these homes that we've designed this offer for have usually. Um, Three, three to five wards, depending, and each ward has 15 residents. Now this is gonna change a little bit in the coming months because we're gonna be dealing with differently organized communities. But um, basically they wanna know that the residents are living you know, a quality lifestyle, not only the caregivers, but family members and the administration. So they want to make sure that people are able to do things, um, you know, beyond just the basics of like having good hygiene and sanitary conditions in the home and eating good food. They want to know that people are able to do art and listen to music and go outside is a really important one uh, that they get to, you know, experience nature, uh, go to cultural events and do, you know, just like li like activities you would consider a part of a fulfilling life, even though these, these are elderly people who are in, um, who really need a lot of assistance to do basic tasks? They should. They they deserve to have, you know, access to basic well-being activities. So yeah, it's not like fitness in the sense of we're not um, tracking heart rate and things like that, but just really rudimentary information we're collecting. You know, just a selected number of people and what they did if they went outside and when they did that, that and how long they were outside for, like 30 minutes. And who did that? Was it family or a volunteer or some staff? Or was it a self-guided activity? And then those will show up on the home page here. And I haven't refreshed this dummy data, so, but every day we'd want the residents to have at least one of these type of activities. Yeah, I think we could use it at all stages of life, Rekabik. Making sure we're just doing, we're taking care of our well-being on different levels. It could be good for, um, you know, like daycares to make sure that the children are getting certain things. Uh, they get to do art and music and stuff like that, too. I mean, all of our life we need these. <laughs> And it shows the overall trend of the home. This, since the dummy data is not refreshing, the trend is decreasing in people who are excellent, have an excellent level of activity and moderate level is increasing. And then soon we'll start to see this red line creeping up as it drops below a certain threshold. Okay, so let's take a look at the, uh, the charts. I mean, this is, this is what, why we're here basically is to build these charts and com communicate this in really simple and intuitive ways. But for this particular task, I'm really deep in the weeds uh, with subscriptions and stuff like that, not looking at the activity data. But this is an important feature too. Uh, 
So if I find this publication, let's let's look there. So where are we at? Client publication, server publications, residents. Here we go. So current user visible resident residents. There we go. Yeah, we have, this has been a long thing. Right now we're using, just to directly answer your question, right now we're using Plotly. Plotly.js. It's a, oh, there it went. It's a cross-platform plotting library. Uh, it's got a really, it's consistent, a high-level API. The way you define charts, uh, you, is consistent no matter what type of chart you're using, basically. You, you pass in what are called series, or traces, sorry, traces. Uh, and then you tell the traces what type they are. So every trace is defined the same way. These are three scattered traces, but they could be bar traces. So if you need a bar plot, you pass in the X and Y data and tell it bar or scatter, or you make your scatter a line uh, by connecting the dots with lines and markers. Uh, so yeah, we spent like, on this project and another one I was working on at the t uh, time this project was born, uh, we spent like two years trying out several charting libraries in JavaScript. And I gotta say, it's just kind of a mess. Like, uh, you know, I'm gra grateful for the people to share these plotting libraries. Um, but man, just each one had just weird limitations and things that was left out. And I had to use like f three or four plotting libraries to get a basic set of plots that worked. And the APIs are different for all these libraries. And, um, I just wish people would, you know, I mentioned this earlier about fragmentation in the front end component framework. There's certainly a lot of fragmentation and, and just immaturity in JavaScript in general. I wish these JavaScript charting library developers would work together on a solid cross-cutting library. And in any case, long short of it is Plotly is that it's got a, it's got commercial backing, uh, a really holistic design, like well thought out. Documentation's a little bit uh, difficult to get around some of the examples. You, you just gotta read examples and think about how the example's working. They do have a fully documented API. So yeah, highly recommend Plotly. Um, just for what it's worth, we were previously using NVD3. Uh, it's got a pretty good API, um, a decent set of components, interactivity, which is an important one. So yeah, we would find charting libraries that maybe had a good API and some good charts, but weren't interactive. Or um, This one is pretty well designed, but not super well maintained. If I view their GitHub repo, let's take a look. Contributors. Yeah, it's basically flatlined. So I had to get off of the NVD3. It's not as robust as Plotly. We also use metrics graphics for a while. Uh, I liked it. It came out of Mozilla. Uh, really good API. They use a data oriented API that you basically pass in a, uh, an array of objects and you use accessors to tell what properties to render on what access. I think that is a really good design personally because uh, it saves just a little bit of steps on having to map over these arrays of data. Uh, at least it does it implicitly. I don't have to do it explicitly. I think that's a good developer experience. Um, the subset of graphs though that metrics graphics provides is very limited And it's pretty much flatlining also. So it's just, and there's more. I could show you like Chart.js and several more, several others. Some of them use Canvas to render, some of them use D3 underneath. I've really been wanting to use, try to stick with one that uses D3 EJS because I think, you know, build on things. It's the ethos that's really impressed me. Sorry, this is a long tangent, but this is something that's been really core to my work for several years and a uh, big source of frustration, but also something I'm very interested in and uh, invested in. Um, the thing about building on stuff, the Python ecosystem has this ethos of like building up and up and up and taking something and extending it. Um, you look at stuff like 
NumPy, you know, that had to sort of replace Python arrays for memory efficiency. And then Pandas extended on NumPy and made that into uh, added like metadata and functions so you could have data frames and things like that. And then you have library, you know, like extensions for NumPy that allow you to do Plotly in other charts. So, yeah. Yeah, it's really a big mess. Uh, Reykjavik. Yeah, Chart.js has a lot of nice as qualities, aspects. It's a, uh, they just didn't build on D, D3.js. It was my main concern there. Uh, you know, also, let me see. I think uh, something about their API bar chart. Let me see the code documentation. Um, yeah, th this is good that they did a consistent API where everything is a chart and you define the type, um, data sets. This, I don't like having them. Well, well, let's see. I like a selector API where you kind of select, you pass in raw objects, so to speak. This is passing in an array. Hmm, let me see if I wanted to do. I should say a line chart. Data equals data. Well, that's not so up. Show me one with some data, but I believe it's just going to be an array of values. Yeah, data is an array. Point x y. So you have to map your data to the semantics of the charting library, and I believe this, the charting library should embrace the semantics of the data the other way around. Data oriented API, uh, and that uh, is the philosophy I believe of the Seaborn Seab charting library in Python. There's just a lot of options and different approaches. Uh, there's another one that's really worth mentioning is, uh, but I'm having troubles remembering the name. And this is an example. So Seaborn built on top of matplotlib, which is this sort of low level plotting API and uh, Python and integrates with pandas. So that's a synergistic approach to developing things. I wish that the JavaScript community would take more. Maybe there's examples of JavaScript community doing these synergistic things, but uh, I've felt a sense, more of a sense of fragmentation. I've tried to get myself out of JavaScript as much as possible, <laughs> but here I am doing JavaScript development, API abstraction across visualization. So you have consistency for each visualization. It's uh, more or less going to be familiar if you're already familiar with other ones. What is this? There's this really cool low level API, but I just didn't have trouble with this. Altair is building on it. I'm getting closer. Oh, that's not it. Oh boy. Something else. Declarative visualizations. This is a, a sort of, and it's built on Vega. That's what I was looking for, Vega and Vega Lite. Okay, cool. I've been a, a little bit out of touch with these. Um, again, we made the decision to go to Plotly and I don't really regret it. I think it's got a good, uh, a lot of different charts. It's cross platform, meaning cross language at least, Python, JavaScript specifically. Uh, just really well done. It, it does render things to Canvas when appropriate or WebGL, maybe even, I don't know. But it's still a little bit imperative. I still have to do some mapping over, um, I can show you an example, charts. Let's see, there's some chart methods, but if I go to client views, let's take a look at the home. Homes chart, for example, single home. Activities, status. I'll just show you a quick example of the charting stuff, because this is, this is where the meat of our application is. Uh, so basically, when we're setting up a chart, we have to take some data, which are typically raw objects, 
and extract properties out of those objects and map it to arrays that conform to the, again, the semantics. So X and Y is not too opaque, right? But it's for a bar chart. Uh, but I would just like to say, hey, charting library, render the home percentage on the X's, which we'll pre pretty much we did here, but it, you know we had to map it to an array and stuff like that. So this is going over each of them. I don't know, it's just kind of in producing one uh, trace for each of the three levels. Uh, so it's more of an imperative API. I have to do more hand-holding in the code so there's this tendency in a couple of examples where you can get more declarative. You essentially go in and you design your chart by saying, here's how I want it to look, not here's how to parse the data. Let the charting library do the underlying parsing for you. Um, and this Altair is built on Vega, which is really nice. And we were considering using this for our plotting library, but we went with Plotly. Um, what you know this isn't necessarily going to be totally simple there's still quite a lot of complexity to, to learn um, but the words that they're using when they define these charting constructs i think they're they're coming out of like academic literature and you know some of them are common like axes and marks that you put on um, a chart and what your data are and what type of you know, transformations you're applying. This is all just declarative. There's no mapping or anything like that. So you just kind of learn this declarative way of describing charts that you can even apply just when you're reading the New York Times and you see a chart. In the New York Times, you can see, well, these are the scales and the marks they use for that chart. So it's actually a, a vocabulary of describing this violin pl plot and things like that. So I really like that approach. Uh, maybe we would be able to use Vega or Vega Lite in a project sometime soon because it's very flexible. But I think just at the end of the day, we went with Plotly. And I don't, yeah, again, I don't regret it. Metrics graphics, and we replaced all of our charting libraries with Plotly. So here's a few metrics graphics examples. You know, they got nice little bit of a hover mode there. This is nice showing confidence band. And you can do a regression line, but yeah, this is mainly for line charts, essentially. Whereas Plotly is just showing geographic information. You can transform the data, filters, animate. It has events. You know, it's really good. Uh, I'll send you the link in the chat. Rekabix says, I took a Python course last semester and really enjoyed the language. Recently took up JavaScript as I want to pursue web dev path. I prefer the syntax of Python though. Yeah, I agree with that sentiment, that whole statement. That's, um, I really enjoy also Python syntax and yeah, there's just a lot you can do with web development. And that's the kind of, that's where I'm at too. So I really enjoy the web platform. And JavaScript is not all that bad of a language. I just think there's some problems with the ethos of the community. Perhaps because it's kind of, well, a couple of things. This is my, my hypothesis, basically, that JavaScript is really easy to get into first in web development. So that's made, that's made it possible for me to actually start a whole career as I just started web developing, meant learning basics of HTML and JavaScript and CSS. And it led me to further down the line of doing, you know, programming as a full-time job. So that's a really big plus. But it's also meaning that a lot of people without a lot of um, depth of experience are entering the field, uh, which is a good, it's a hugely important thing, I believe. But that sometimes when we're new, we're, we want to do things our way or are part of our learning journey rather than learning uh, the way things work currently. We'd rather just sort of invent while we work. And I think that's maybe why a lot of the reinvention occurs in, in JavaScript unnecessarily, like these plotting libraries. Uh, some people who, rather than learning, and maybe they're, at that time they started some of these projects, there weren't good options out there like Plotly. Like Plotly wasn't open source. Uh, so they, out of necessity, invented their own charting library. 
or they wanted to do it just slightly different. So there's the bike sharing approach. And I think the Python ecosystem is a little more mature. And I don't know if there's more of a barrier to entry, but something there's some different quality there. Not to say that things don't get reinvented in Python. Yeah, and the 50 different frameworks that companies want you to know, Rekabik says. Yeah, there's that also because the companies are vying for mind share. They want to be seen as, well, they want to re recruit talent, top talent. And so if you're using their technologies, you're more likely to go in the, the direction they they want to be seen as. Prob you know, it's also marketing. I think Facebook and Google have a lot when when they're able to build a name for themselves in the developer community. Microsoft is certainly pushing for this lately. You know, with the acquisition of Google and things. Yeah, and I'm not sure that, you know, Angular and React, Angular, yeah, the new one, and React or, or, or Vue, they're not maybe like fundamentally different. Maybe there's some more similarities than differences. kind of seeing this same thing with uh, with deep learning you know Google's developing out TensorFlow and I think Apple is trying to get involved now with artificial intelligence and another dangerous aspect of this is that the companies are fragmenting the platform like the web platforms is is one thing that has historically been very difficult to develop a set of unifying standards that work, you know, despite your operating system. But now Google and Apple and Microsoft to a certain extent, they have their own platforms outside of the web platform and you have to develop platform specific code and they become gatekeepers of what code can be published and distributed on their platform and what kind of revenue um, can be earned and they take a share of that revenue. So rekabic has been uh, doing JavaScript for a bit and the foundations of JavaScript aren't enough. You have to learn frameworks like React or Angular. And so maybe they're not able to put as much time and focus on learning the, the core language, JavaScript concepts. They have to jump straight to React or Vue or Angular. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. And you know, granted that these they're written in JavaScript, so you're gonna by proxy be learning JavaScript. But there's so one thing that can be that comes to mind is that when you use a mature framework, and it could be React and Vue and Angular, uh, but by way of example, the Django framework, the way it's designed embraces not only language features like Pythonic code, but also high level design concepts um, that you might not encounter just, just studying the language like class oriented design or what would be an example? I'm not sure how much Django, how, you, how much it uses composition. Yeah, I'm really impressed by Django and I'm trying to incorporate it more into my daily work, but I haven't, I don't have a really big project. I'd like to, I kind of have a fantasy about porting this Jerry Life project over from Python to Django. Not that it would solve all the problems that I'm facing, but just that Django is really mature and still actively developed. And uh, there are some problems in the Django community. You know, it's not a hot new JavaScript framework. So getting developers to use Django and it's not JavaScript. So those two aspects, not JavaScript also, right? Those two aspects are kind of strikes against it to a certain extent. 
But what it does have going, and I think is, well, first, Python is a really nice language. The documentation is really comprehensive. They've got a great tutorial. And I'm, like every aspect of the framework that I've ever touched in projects that I have worked on a little bit um, is well documented, like almost comprehensively to the point of like, sometimes it's almost like a textbook. Um, that can be said for other Python libraries like Scikit, Learn. Also, when I'm reading the documentation for these projects, I'm, it's like reading a textbook. Like they have all links to the literature that informed how it was designed. So yeah, that's back to the point. It's like use a framework that has some maturity, whether it's a machine learning framework or a web framework, uh, and component UI, you know, JavaScript UI components, uh, libraries. It's not going to give you that f bigger picture. And when we're learning, we should be, you know, like when we're first cutting our teeth, and I'm still learning every day. Uh, we should be lear learning in a, so to speak, a controlled environment, like one that's already been tested and developed for us and not inventing our own framework. And I think a lot of new developers enter JavaScript and have to almost invent the framework and it's a nascent community. And things change so much that there's so much reinvention going on. I think Angular and Vue in the JavaScript community, they have a little bit more of a framework built around them and more of the components are part of the core, which is really important. Meteor is kind of a framework, but there were some key components, I believe, that were left to the community that have now been neglected, such as the router, for one. So Rekabek, what kind of project do you want to work on? Uh, are you just learning to get a job or is there a particular um, thing that excites you that you might be able to bring your developer skills to something in life that you think there might be a tool you could build a software tool you could build to help improve current user visible residence this I'll use this will at least back to the code if I use this current user visible residence this will at least lower the scope of residents that um, are subscribed So here, if I check my template here, 12, Meteor, Mini Mongo Resident. So yeah, now we have 20 residents. I think that's a good improvement. Oh, wait a minute, that's because I'm on the wrong template. So I should be in the residence template, boom. <laughs> of course, that's a good improvement. All right, what do we got here? 146 residents. You know, I think that's about right. If I just switch this back. It's pretty slow, 324. So it is in fact working, but this is an example that even with just a few homes, you know, 15 people living in the home at the same time, moving in and out, they move in a new resident maybe every three or six months. That's a rough estimate. I don't work there on a daily basis, but uh, there's not a high turnover rate. People do live there for a while. But with 15 people, there's every three or six months, I guess, some likelihood that one of those residents will leave for various reasons. So what I'm trying to say, or trying to get an intuition for, is how many residents over the course of time will be visible on this residence page. And secondly, this departed field, if it's in use, will I still, so if I, if I haven't selected to include departed, I should probably have just as many residencies, residence as residencies is what I'm trying to get at, I guess. And that's where a composite publication comes in. Basically your residencies will pull along the related data. But for the reactive uh, table, I can't use the composite. So either I rewrite this or 
or I take this all residents and kind of do the same thing with this current user visible residencies. Let me double check my, oh, it's not, not the all residents, but the uh, current user visible residents. So here it is, actually, where I'm getting person IDs, I could use this method in an argument to toggle Rekabik says, no current project on the board, mostly learning as much as possible, graduating with a bachelor's of science in computer information technology, looking to enroll in full stack boot camp, still weighing options though. That's cool. And you might not need a boot camp, but uh, what, are you, what are you trying to get out of the boot camp? Just a structured learning path, essentially, and a time frame to learn it in? Or what's, the, what's appealing to you about the boot camp? This is used in three places and it's defined here. No? That's where I am. Here's where it's defined. Essentially, okay, so you're actually going to to physically relocate. It's not an online boot camp. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so here I can parameterize this user visible active resident IDs. I can move this active part to a second parameter here, which would also need to be passed in from get user visible active resident IDs. So moving out of the function name into the parameters has a good design principle anyway. Into the arguments. So I need to open all these files that are using this method. And this will now take an argument. Visible, kid, user visible resident IDs. So taking the active out of there.
this one wanted the active, so I'll make sure it's not going to get me departed. Get user visible resident IDs, and then it's used in the query there. Get user visible. So this takes an argument. That's true. Like uh, moving to a more popular, uh, so Reykjavik wants to move to a more popular area that has a need for web dev, and working along like-minded people will be good learning career and uh, for good learning <laughs> and career opportunities. Yeah, that totally. I agree there. Uh, now a lot of uh, our work can be done remotely, but it yeah totally is. It's really nice to work side by side with people. You know, having meetings and uh, building energy uh, towards a common goal and things like that. Uh, meetings can also be really draining, though. It depends on the way the organization is, uh, what the co organization culture is. Um, what kind of cities are you looking at? What are you thinking about? Have you got any? It's probably Silicon Valley, <laughs> the Bay Area. All right, so now we're down to the method. Yeah, get user visible residency IDs. Get user visible residency IDs. Let me just double check here. Resident IDs. I'm, I'm not looking at residencies right now, so let me just close that out. That's what we're subscribing to here. Current user visible residents. Bootcamp that piques uh, my interest is Dev Mountain. They have campuses in Dallas, Phoenix, and Salt Lake City. Yeah, I think I might have heard of that one. Uh, I was thinking Phoenix for some reason. Yeah, Dallas is, sounds like a good city. Never visited. Let me think. I drove down through Texas. I used to live in Kansas and my work we had to deliver some sort of art supplies I went down there with the boss's son it's quite an interesting trip all right then so where's my method publications publications methods get user visible residents passing that in there departed now Visible resident CIDs. Oh, wait, that was it. How do I change the query? There, I, it just didn't look like I could edit that text. Uh, what? Oh, it's in the same file. Isn't it? I think I changed it prematurely. So I passed this departed argument all the way through the chain of code. Now what to do with it? I essentially need to set up the um, selector. So first homes, then residencies. And here,
I will make a variable. And what's in here? So we need that. Uh, is there an example? I've just been working with this. It was a spread, but then I have to say, So that's the field I want to target. Uh, but wait a minute. <laughs> it's conditional. So it's not equals undefined here. If you're passing in a value, you true or false for departed. I want to respect that. So it would be look like this. Selector, and I think uh, I may be confusing JavaScript and Python, but I believe I can do the See, move out equals an object which has a so oh man my brain is so slow at 3 a.m. Uh, it's 4.20 a.m. so Ah, it exists. That's right. Dollar sign. There we go. A nice auto completion there. Equals departed. Boom. I believe that works. So that's true or false, whether or not it exists. So that we get that toggle and good some good errors. Yeah, I'm in Finland. <laughs> I actually, yeah, my sleep cycle goes through weird uh, phases. And for some reason, I was really tired. I fell asleep at like 6 p.m. Then I woke up at 1 a.m. or something. Midnight or 1. So kind of, a, I got a full night's sleep, basically. And now I'll probably, <laughs> uh, I'm here for family. I've been here for about five years. I think this should work. It might be obvious, but a little bit of redundant comments. I'm trying to reduce my amount of redundant comments. Yeah, you might be able to do a, a boot camp over here even. <laughs> it's worth checking out. Also, did you mention internship? Because internships are also a good uh, way, particularly if you can land a paid internship. I was lucky and I landed a paid, uh, or wait, what was I I'm trying to think here? Well, I had a small stipend. I was paid through room and board, so that counts. And landed a paid internship, a technology apprenticeship. 
so that was how I kind of transitioned from just being a pat it's not like not a passive but a uh, you know semi-active volunteer web developer technology kind of enthusiast to like actually working did that for a couple of years and then basically eh, slowly was able to transition um, for people from the states internships yeah I don't know off the top of my head but let me think here and you said you've already got a was it a bachelor's of science? One thing you could really think about, <laughs> I don't know if you're interested in this, but you can study in Europe and um, continue, like get a master's degree here. Uh, and depending on where you go, the education will be free. If you study in Germany, for example, I think your tuition is free. And so basically what you would allow, by default, you can't stay in Europe beyond to the 90 days. You get a temporary visa when you visit without having to do any, any fancy stuff because you're a U.S. citizen. But if you want to stay beyond 90 days, you need a work permit or a study permit or uh, some other way of getting residency, like family ties. So there are study options. That would get you in the door. You have the key, the hard part is getting a a, a visa to stay, right? Um, and I don't know if an internship would qualify you if you have some work, uh, but they want to make sure that you're going to be able to sustain yourself. So an unpaid internship wouldn't give you that sustainability. Check this site out. And uh, I should mention that, yeah, no, it clear, it's uh, from other countries. So you'd be in the second column there, tuition for other countries. And Finland is pretty cheap. It used to be free and they changed it just like last year that Finland now is 5,000 euros a year to get master's degree though, um, that's pretty cheap. But France, Germany, and Norway all offer free, uh, tuition-free studies for anybody in the world. I think that's really remarkable, especially when you look at the state of things in the United States education system. Yeah, and then so while you're here studying, you could be working an internship and traveling a little bit. That you can take the train all over Europe. There's a lot of you know, like student rail pass, a lot of uh, cheap ways to get around and, and meet people, etc. All right, so I think this is relatively readable code. Not too many comments. I've had a tendency in the past to add a lot of comments. All right, now let's see how badly things are breaking in the client. So there we go, no residents. So this column's not working, that's cool, that's cool. Oh, it is working, oh my goodness. And there's a slight difference, 63 residents, 64 residencies. made a big difference in the residents, but not the residencies. Okay, so I probably got a bug still in my residencies code. Or the dummy data. This is such a challenging thing because <laughs> I'm a sole developer and I haven't really been very rigorous in the way I've developed this code. Uh, I just don't have the capacity to do such rigorous development as we do at my day job. 
or particularly the back end team. Fortunately, at my day job, I'm working on a small greenfield project, so I don't have to have that level of rigor. But yeah, this, I mean, I don't mean to discount it, like having test coverage and really good ways of mocking out stuff is valuable where I could be having some confidence that with our mock data, you know, I've got some residencies that have move out dates. Well, I mean, I, I can test that here. You know that it's basically simulating the um, the environment we're trying to model. The software is, you know, model of reality, and it's some sort of a tool or instrument to have an impact on that reality. So it's both a reflection and sort of an extension of our desire. Reflection of reality and an extension of our desire for that reality. So meteor shell. Mm, how do we get this? So, residencies, I'll find one. Okay, so that works, and it's got a move-in date, but move-out doesn't exist. So let's find one with a move-out that does exist. Just a seat. That works, all right. Now, <laughs> so what I think we're gonna end up doing is hiring this, we're actually making a little bit of revenue with this. Not super much, we're not you know, expecting to like hit the jackpot like Las Vegas, but we do wanna sustain the initiative, sustain the development, provide value, build a business, uh, and hire people who are also passionate about this project and the idea of elder care in general. So we might be able to hire a QA uh, person we have in the past to run over some of our code, test it around the edges, test some of the key use scenarios, uh, improve things like this mismatch in the residence residencies here that I'm seeing. Rekabek, have you done any freelancing, by the way? Or any kind of, uh, have you gotten any paid development time? So what I want to test here is that, let me close a couple of these tabs, just one here so I don't get so confused. Essentially, did I have a residency that I can change this residencies here? Yeah, well, one thing is just to start with something you're interested in, and seriously. Um, scratch an itch. So, you know, that's how this project was actually born, this Jerry Life project. Um, at the time, I was sort of, I had just come to Finland, and I was in an awkward situation. I was still in my like 90 day period, I think even, where I just had a temporary visa, a tourist visa, which you automatically get for visiting Europe. Didn't have any work. And um, my son's mom said, hey, there's this elder care home around the corner. You know, maybe they need some help, why don't you check them out? So I was like, yeah, that's a good idea. And went over there and um, I don't speak Finnish still to this day very well. I'm learning and I recognize more and more, but at that point I, I really didn't know Finnish. And now I just don't know Finnish. So maybe not so much emphasis on not knowing, but uh, they're like, okay, well, that's fine. They showed me my, they showed me up to this care home and they said, hey, uh, you, uh, you know, the best thing that residents need really is someone just to go outside with them and enjoy the sunshine. And so I would just go there and ask a nurse, you know, does anyone want to go outside? And they'd be like, yeah try going out with Anya, something like that. And so then we would just go outside, me or another volunteer there, and you know we would just sit or go for a, a walk around the campus. So the main thing is that I started noticing that it was a little difficult to know who had been outside recently or what the status of these uh, residents were in terms of like doing other activities too. And a nurse had given me this little 
notebook, a little pocket notebook to, to make any notes and keep track of who I'd went out with and stuff like that. And uh, so it became apparent to me and my partner Mario now, who has been on uh, developing this whole platform with me, uh, that that information would be useful to be shared amongst the volunteers and nurses. And that not only is it good to share, you know, in this raw form, like words and, and a big table of activities, but there's better ways of communicating that data. So this was a genuine need and basically it spawned this whole project. It was something I was already actively engaging in and sort of interested in. And not only was I interested in, you know, helping the elderly people be more active, but I was also learning to develop software at that time too. So I was interested in both those aspects of it and I was very interested in data visualization. So what I'm getting at is take some time and reflect on what motivates you, what's interesting to you in the world. Not just, uh, I'm not saying that you're doing this, but not just that you're interested in software, right? Or maybe having a good career, but beyond that, you know, what kind of impact do you want to have? What kind of legacy do you want to have? And try to feel how your body reacts when you're thinking about those things. Like if it's, you know, working with children or working with nature or transportation or elderly or helping people find knowledge or helping people share knowledge and publish some uh, articles or whatever it is, there's so many disciplines that where software can be applied. And when we go to college and we study information communication technology, we're studying maybe a little bit of broader context, but we're really focusing on the technology. And my philosophy is that technology, and this probably goes without saying, but technology is a tool that's embedded in a social system, right? These are tools that we use to improve our lives, whether it's communication, you know, knowledge sharing, health. So look at the broader context and I hope that your university program had helped you do that too. And I think some do that to more or less extent. They give you basically applied knowledge. But I also think there's a tendency in the academia to just focus in on the research of the technology and maybe not the social context. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I had the good fortune to sort of come out of this through, come out of technology through like a social uh, lens, like how technology can help improve communication, improve activism, improve, you know, nonprofit outreach, improve elderly well-being, improve people's ability, you know, transportation, knowledge sharing, all of the projects I've worked on uh, have pretty much been applied directly to, you know, people's and organizations' goals. So I, you know, I haven't had really the. I think it's also really valuable to have a formal educational background. I don't have that, but my colleague, you know, a few of my colleagues at work, they do, and I can see the richness they bring to the solutions as well. They bring a lot of depth and quality to the and to and discipline to the work. So. That stuff is definitely valuable as well. All right, residence page should only be show user visible residence. This is pretty much working. I just want to clean it up a little bit. Wait a minute, is it? Oh, I'm on activities. <laughs> residence, yeah, so this is working. Yeah, my, so Reykjavik says, my university kind of shoves the information down my throat not really any kind of social aspects, well, at least for the technology curriculum. They could definitely work on that aspect. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of information that they want to try to, to just try to instill in you, I guess is the word, the important sort of, maybe more of a banking metaphor. They want to, as you said, sham it, shove it down your throat. And, you know, I think maybe not all that information is super important up front to get started in a career. What I think some of the skills that are most important, and maybe your college 
promoted these as well, but uh, things like resiliency, like being able to fail and face frustration. And sometimes maybe you feel like you're gonna cry because you're so frustrated, like, but still persevere or put it down for a day and come back to it the next day and pick it back up and say, all right, let's try this again, you know, give yourself some space. Um, it's just some really frustrating times in development that you just gotta get through or flow around, try a different angle on it. You know, so that's a hugely important life skill that I guess you can, you can sort of teach in university. You know, obviously you're there at the university to learn, but I think that's one of the most important skills that I, fa that I use on a daily basis because no matter how much a university would program would hope, they can never give you all the information you will need, right? You will, so it's rather than having a checklist of this is the information you need, what becomes more important as you go into your career is like finding the information you need at the time it's relevant to so the research process and becoming really efficient at quickly finding the information. You've probably noticed uh, in the little bit I've been developing here that I'm doing, you know, searches for things as I go. I can't remember, you know, how me how meteor subscriptions work, how to pass an argument in there, you know, so I had to just make sure that it was cool that my publication could take an argument and can I pass named arguments. That, still, I got little nuances. So that's super important. Paying attention to the details, reading for meeting, that's an important one. Uh, I have the luxury, and I think you do too, we're native English speakers. <laughs> but reading and writing are super important to us. And you'll probably face this problem when you're working with the library where the documentation's not well written. It doesn't matter if it's a native English person who wrote it, but sometimes just taking the time to write something down um, can feel like an impediment or just feel like a waste of time when a developer wants to just make something work. Have you done any writing? Do you have a, like a blog or anything or any um, social media where you, where you do a little bit of writing and communicating your thoughts and ideas? I'm sure that you've written essays for college. I mean, I don't doubt that. So the test here on the residents. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be super fancy. Just check this one out, dev.2. It's um, just publish little snippets here and there and build up a community and a habit. Um, you'd be surprised. Like, you know, people will give you love and claps and comments and talk to you about it. Okay, good. Yeah, that's a nice one. I think it's a pretty good community. Actually, the platform's open source, too. Yeah, I, I joined recently also. Okay, so you joined it last night. Well, that's good timing. Cool. What's your, uh, what's your username here? I'll follow you. How do we get to a username? Like if I do this one. It's right here. Okay. Do you have BX, BXKER? All right, cool. Is it all right that I showed your, your yeah, looking for a boot camp. That sounds like you, Kentucky, cool. All right. Nice. I usually try to do things off stream when the site has like advertisements or other kind of intellectual property that I don't want to get a copyright strike for. I want to be able to stream this and upload it to YouTube and things later. Or just that there's private information on there. I don't want to show that to the stream. Okay, cool. All right, so there's just one more thing I want to take care of real quick. And I have to get my mind in a focus mode. That's something I've had troubles on uh, in life. 
conscious focus and mindfulness. All right, so this move in date, move out date, I wanna check that this residency departed toggle is, is having an effect, which it does seem to be. But the number of res, no, no, the number of residents has changed, not the number of residencies. So yeah, that's what I wanna see is, um, If I add a residency to a home that this user can view, like North of Richerland, or if I take one of the residencies that already exists, like Annabelle B, I edit that residency. Oh, I can't edit the residency here because I'm not an admin. I'll just do this in another tab real quick. Residence. A N A B E L L E B. Edit residency. I set a move out date for Annabelle to the 1st of April. All right, then Annabelle is gone from both screens because it's reactive. Very good. And 63. Okay, so that worked. Let's try Agnes. Watch carefully. Agnes L on top of the list. Agnes L. I'm editing as an admin on a different in a different browser. Over the network. Saving Agnes. Boom. Gone. Because there's very little network latency. That's one of the remarkable things about Meteor. Rekabek, have you worked with Meteor.js or any other kind of reactive programming framework? Oops, and that, that should say 62, but yeah, I mean, it, yeah, I believe it's working with good enough confidence that I can ship it 62. Residence is always off by one from the residencies. I'm not sure what's going on there. It could be a bug. Why does the residence always come with one extra. Oh yeah, cool, yeah. When Meteor started, I think uh, I came became aware of it maybe in 2014. It had been around for a few years, maybe it started in like 2012, I don't know how, how old it was at that point, but uh, the ethos and the philosophy was about developer simplicity, about giving a simple, framework for quickly getting applications running and in production without having to worry about things like uh, sort of build systems and installing doc, uh, database or even choosing between database because it, it only works with media, uh, MongoDB. Yeah, so that's how I basically I learned to code. I had read a book on Python and read about Ruby on Rails a little bit and done some uh, JavaScript programming on Khan Academy. <laughs> but that's the extent of my background. But Meteor opened that door and I had done like decent amount of like web development, HTML in terms of like web standards stuff, but not any kind of formal development and certainly not developing end to end application. So Meteor was that logical next step in my learning journey. It gave a really quick way for people who are already familiar with HTML, CSS, and a little bit of JavaScript to start building meaningful things. Like with only a little bit of effort, you could do, you could spin up, and you still can spin something up in a weekend. Uh, but now it's a lot more React oriented and things like that. So there's that learning curve on top of it. I think we need more tools like this though. And then this reactivity notion is really cool and Meteor, and there's a couple other things like Feathers JS um, that give you sort of real-time data. What happens is um, in Meteor, when the data changes on the server, client applications, the stuff running in the web browser, is listening for those changes that you know, they're subscribed to. Yeah, it looks like everybody's using React. I mean, you can't avoid it, so yeah. But basically this uh, 
cool thing about the reactivity is when MongoDB changes data, it like stores those changes to this this log called operation log or op log. And Meteor developers figured out how to how do you look at those op log changes and then look inside of the Meteor application for any query that would be affected by that change and rerun that query and push the data over WebSockets, I think, to all the clients. Pretty rad. Um, then later on, so, um, I think a couple of databases were developed that actually had this reactivity built in because the op log tailing was like a side effect of uh, MongoDB being a distributed database. Uh, I don't know if you can do this with Postgres. I don't know if anyone's tacked on. A, I think they've tried that with Meteor. I don't know if it's reactive or not. Yeah, I think they have a pretty good getting started document. And since you're already heading towards React, it's going to be aligned with what you're trying to do. Let me double check. Uh, you know, they also say that it's, you can use it with Vue and Angular. Uh, I'm really interested in Vue and using it with Vue. Um, but the documentation's a, well, I guess it's there. I, I don't know how to port an existing application to Vue, but if you're just getting started on a fresh project, you can certainly choose your own adventure here. If React is your style and where you're thinking that your path is headed, that I believe is the most well-documented. Another cool thing, so it includes the MongoDB out of the box. Uh, the Meteor core developers, they started uh, another project for that's GraphQL oriented. It's uh, called Apollo. I don't know if there's a link down here. So if you think you're interested in GraphQL, you might check out that Apollo server. And then the final thing, you know, this is, they're publishing these on NPM, but um, also your Meteor app, Meteor comes packaged with Cordova. You don't have to kind of seek these things out. It's already built in. So if you're wanting to build uh, not a native app, but a hybrid, oh yeah, you can deploy the Meteor application anywhere. It's just node underneath the thing. Um, so I'll show you a good thing that's useful called Meteor Up, Deploy Meteor Apps. What basically it does is turns your, so it builds your Meteor project, it's kind of like compiles it, so to speak, to Node.js or transpiles it or whatever. So then at that point, this is just a regular Meteor command. You don't need Meteor Up for this. There's a Meteor dash, dash build or something like that that turns it into a Node.js app. At that point, you can run it anywhere Node.js can run with a little bit of manual work. And, uh, you know, you might need a reverse proxy and stuff like that. What Meteor Up does is gives you one command, Meteor space up. It builds your app as a Node app, then packages it in a Docker container, then SSH is into whatever remote ser server you have configured on DigitalOcean, Linode, you name it, you will need a, a VPN, VPS for this, sorry. But those are like five bucks a month. And deploys and configures your React app, uh, so your Meteor app, including HTTPS with Let's Encrypt. It's so nice, you can see it right here. It, it pushes the code up to the server, configures everything, uh, sets environment variables, starts the daemon, make sure everything's running. It's literally one command, Meteor up. Um, the configuration is like, well, so here it is. It's a three-step thing to get the whole, to get off the ground. So you, you say mup init to create the config file. It's just a JSON. And you can store this right in your project in a dot deploy folder. That's actually a good practice. If you're deploying it to multiple servers, you might well, yeah, you can still keep it in your, pro if you're, sorry, if you're committing your code to GitHub or whatever, you don't want to keep your, um, your deployment folder on GitHub. So you'd, you'd want to put that in your Git ignore because it, uh, it will have a little bit of information in there, such as the server address. Uh, you'll need a SSH key. So you have to configure your VPS so you can SSH into it and use a key based authentication instead of password. Uh, instead of like a server password. That's a good practice. Okay, but with those caveats out of the way, uh, you got their configuration set up. Then you run MUP setup, 
command and it, it goes to the server via SSH, which is why you needed this um, to look at this section and sets up, you know, installs Docker, installs Mongo in the Docker container. Um, and maybe a couple other things, I don't know, off the top of my head. And then the final thing that you do, once those are done, you can kind of forget about doing those again. You don't have to do those maybe once a year, or once every six months, uh, is MUP deploy. And you'll run this MUP deploy command pretty much any time you push a new feature to your master branch or whatever, wherever you're deploying. So when I merge this pull request, for example, I'm, I'm gonna run MUP deploy, it's my next command, on the servers, and we're deploying this on a couple of servers. So pretty pretty easy way to get started. It's basically, you know, one one page A4 documentation to get started. Uh, there are some nuances, but there it's pretty well described. You know, it sets up an nginx re reverse proxy with SSL support. You just kind of got to opt into SSL, but it uses Let's Encrypt, which is a free SSL provider. So you get HTTPS for free, uh, basically out of the box. Um, you know, if you want to execute extra code around these life cycles, then there's ways of doing that. That's advanced stuff, I guess. If you want to configure your Docker build, maybe install some dependencies. Like if you run an Im image magic to do image conversion or compression or whatever, you know, you could put those into your Docker, but it's all pretty much a declarative, uh, JSON thing. So depending on what kind of app you build, you might install some Linux level stuff. Um, what else is worth mentioning? You know, there's things where you'll want to get the server logs. It's got a command for that to tail the logs or whatever. Restart the thing. Um, it's pretty cool. So it's, yeah, it's flexible. That was one of the concerns though, what you're asking, uh, Meteor people were kind of concerned that you could only deploy Meteor to the, what is it? the kind of commercial hosting. That is one way that Meteor was able to fund the development and it still does fund the development though. So it might be worth it, worth the cost if, you're, if your app seems to grow and gets a community. Okay, so one thing I noticed though is when I include this departed My residence list grows. But my residencies is not changing. So let me double check the toggle there. Start on the outside and work my way in. So if it's, it is departed, so I'm sharing these residencies, just one has a parameter now. Current user visible residencies. Publication should take this. Departed argument. Those are subscriptions. Here's the publication. There it does. Let me just console log this. Oh, the other one and see if this is registering. I'll see it in the browser, uh, not, no, sorry, the server console. Okay. Move out is false. Okay, so that's never changing. I think it's because I'm
think somehow this auto run function is re is keeping that departed across runs. And again, this is include departed, so I don't want to just exclude the active ones that this needs to be undefined. Is departed is not defined. Okay, well, that's to be expected. Oh, but why is it? Let me double check. screening departed is read only uh, const departed let of course alright interesting. I wonder how it'll take that null value. Okay, so it's coming in as null. So across the server, across the void, it's coming as null. I assumed it would be undefined. So spreading it should have no effect. In fact, I see now residencies at 190, but residence at 61. Now it's possible our, and it seems to be our dummy data is reusing residence. So yeah, that's, as long as I don't see any undefined, to, unknown, there we are. Man, a ton of those. hundred of those. All right, well, I think I'm kind of onto the problem, getting a little bit closer in these server methods. This is null. So I just need to trace this departed throughout these methods. Uh, OK, 
because this is querying it directly. But I had those methods I was working with a minute ago. And I believe that will get these back in sync, 190 and 61. But in any case, residency seems to be working now, 190. Oh, man. And now nobody's. It's cool. Welcome back. <clears throat> All right. So basically, I learned that even though I'm using undefined here, when this subscription is made across the from client to server, this becomes null. Undefined essentially becomes null. So I'm not sure of the nuances of why that's the case. But in any case, I had to just check for it here, being null. And now things are working. This um, this selector where I'm trying to append is either an empty nothing or looking for a move out date is dependent on this departed argument to the publication. I need to do the same thing. I have some server methods. If I can find an example. If I was just working, these are publications. Activities method. Well, in my publications, I was actually using that. Here it is. So here's get visible resident IDs. So let's find this one. I'm going to just double check real quick before I lose this. All right, that looks good. I want to make sure I'm passing that departed argument correctly. Okay, so here comes departed. If I just console log departed, doesn't matter where, but let's just say we're at to what is this? Residence address. And it's method. Invisible residence method. So it's false. Make it a little easier to follow. So it's null there. Either false or null. Same deal. I'm looking at residence, I'll go ahead and close the residencies stuff for now. Get user visible residency IDs. Well, I did pass the departed there. Right, because I need that. Let me just check these three files. Departed. That where I'm defining it. Here I'm passing it in. So I can close this one because it's defined right there in the context current user visible residence. So this is potentially being null. Get visible resident IDs. ideas so I need to check for null there instead of undefined
I think our data are looking better now. There's only a few residents who have been on multiple residencies. I think that's the way that the mock data works. There's no unknown residents, meaning that the client has the data for all the, has the publication or subscription for all the relevant uh, residents. And I've already demonstrated earlier in this session with enough confidence that these residencies are the ones that are only visible to this user. So I think we're on good, on good ground now. few console logs, mainly for errors, logging the mock data creation. So I'm going to ask some QA support on this from our assistant who's working on a few other related tasks. But I think this has been a pretty good session uh, going on three hours. We'll run through these files. I'll make these commits. So I'm just going to do it. Rekabik, if you're interested in doing some open source work, I'm uh, contributing on several projects. I could get you up to speed. Uh, I'm working on a couple of Django projects, one uh, called CiviWiki, uh, which is a sort of a civic engagement platform. We need a lot of help there. It's actually becoming much more popular uh, in terms of people interested in this project. Uh, Sibiwiki.org, Building Learning Democracy in the Internet Age. If you wanted to, so that's mainly Python and Django and some JavaScript on the front end, JavaScript UI. There's a lot of ways to get involved on this project. And some like good first issues. Uh, and then the project I'm working on today, this Jerry Life project, there's a few low hanging fruit on that. Uh, and in the coming months, we'll be hiring. Uh, some developers also with CiviWiki. Um, we occasionally have some funds for developers to take on tasks, particularly if we know they're already familiar with the code. Uh, so yeah, if you're interested, there's a couple of, there's a few opportunities with these two projects and I could probably find uh, some more ways to get you in touch with other open source projects I'm affiliated with help you get de development environment set up and everything like that.
So basically for these methods, I added the departed argument. Do all my inventory. Yeah, that's cool. Basically, it's a good way to get a, you know portfolio up, do meaningful work. Uh, if you don't have your own kind of project idea to kick off, or if, if looking at a greenfield project might be a little bit challenging for you, uh, a lot of times these open source projects have bite-sized tasks and you know I'm promoting the ones that I'm directly affiliated with but uh, there's also a um, good good first issue I think is a really good place let me think here well there's this topic on github so you could just browse github here it is well one second let me find this actually list these good first timers only lists um, up for grabs.net yeah so check this out I can help you with um, the open source projects where I am familiar so getting a you know meteor JS environment set up or doing some Django work uh, I could offer a direct mentorship there and we could have a code session a one-on-one -on -one. but these other projects I'm sure also have similar setup and it might be a good way, you know, you can explore it. If you're interested in JavaScript, you can filter it out there, or if you want to do Python or web development. So you can choose your own adventure. You might find some cool projects that you just want to try out that might be good for something um, interesting that you like to do. Like you might find an open source video editor or 3D editor like Blender JS. Uh, you can contribute in that way too. So it's pretty easy to get started. There's a lot of open source projects out there, and most of them will have some sort of you know, good first timer, low hanging fruit type issue, and maybe even a mentorship framework in place. I mean, there's tons of projects here. If you want to learn Django, they have um, a core men mentorship um, discussion list where they help new members, new people to the community get oriented to the Django core. Okay, so it looks like we're getting I'm just going to check this box. And let me see, now that I've got a few more commits, if our code climate is running to tell me how poor my code is. Hmm. Doesn't seem to be scanning it. Dang it. I still understand the 6162 thing, that's kind of weird. a little bit more explicit. Yeah, it seems to work.
this is something like that. All right, well, it's three hours that I've been on this task at the end of a series of live coding sessions. We've written 1,000 lines of code. Oh my goodness, I didn't realize this had touched so much code. And how many commits? 67 commits now, yeah. So there's definitely some QA work here. I don't know how I touched 1,000 lines of code. It must have been something that I uh, moved some files. 600 lines of those are just moving stuff around, I'm sure of it. Good grief. All right, well, I've been running these, uh, trying to run these live coding sessions about once or twice a week. So I'll try to keep up with that pace. Uh, again, I'm working on this uh, Meteor Mongo JavaScript uh, project to Jerry Life Wellbeing. I'm working on uh, another project for a uh, web publishing platform with uh, Django and Wagtail CMS. And uh, occasionally I'll be working on on a couple other Django projects. I'll start streaming here soon. So if you have any other ideas, uh, you can check out, uh, leave me a comment in the chat or these videos are published on YouTube. You can leave me a comment on the YouTube video if there's a uh, topic you'd like to see covered. I can try to uh, see if I can get a code session set up. Uh, for example, working more with data visualization. Uh, I don't have any of these projects that are using machine learning, but I do that at work. We're working with some machine learning libraries, so I could probably do a session on that. Uh, doing some more database oriented stuff like uh, Postgres, data pipelines, something like that might be a good one. Uh, but mainly these sessions have been oriented on pragmatics and keeping these open source projects going forward. Yeah, thanks Rekha Bick for joining the chat and hanging out. It's been nice, it's always nice to chat with somebody have a good reason to get off topic a little bit and not focus so intensely on the code. Anyway, thanks again for watching everybody and have a great day. Hope to see you around.